let's get started. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Black History Month webinar, The Art of Black Nursing Leadership Still Rising, where we have the distinct privilege of celebrating the exceptional contributions of Drs. Barbara Nichols, Beverly Malone, and Ernest Grant. These iconic trailblazers stand out as the only three African-American nurses to have held the presidency of the American Nurses Association, marking a significant milestone in the history of nursing leadership. I am sure today's discussion will uplift, educate, and inspire all of us. As your moderator, I am deeply honored to explore the remarkable legacies of these pioneering leaders. So as we get started, I would like to introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Barbara Nichols, professional career spans four decades in leadership and policymaking positions in which she's been a champion for the need to value diversity in all aspects of health professions. She is the former chief executive officer of CGFNS International, whose expertise provides credential validation, scope of practice standards, and licensure of nurses and health professionals globally. She presently serves as a national diversity consultant to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, National Implementation of the IO-1 Report, The Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030, Charting a Path to Achieve Health Equity, and also a consultant for the Office of Minority Health and the U.S. Departments of Labor, State, and Department of Homeland Security. She was the first African-American nurse in 100 years to be the president of the ANA. Yes, we deserve a, a round for that. Um, and is the Wisconsin's Nurses Association, oh, and the Wisconsin Nurse Association, respectively. She currently serves as the executive director for the Wisconsin Center for Nursing. And there are many accolades, but some of them that I want to name are, she's received five honorary doctoral degrees, the 2015 City of Madison, Wisconsin, Dr. Martin Luther King Humanitarian Award, and was inducted into ANA's Hall of Fame in 2022. Next, Dr. Beverly Malone, who is currently the president and CEO of the National League for Nursing since 2007. She's contributed to the groundbreaking IOM report, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Health, and has served on the Minority Health Federal Advisory Committee. With over 20 honorary, honorary degrees and numerous accolades, Dr. Malone's distinguished career has blended policy, education, administration and clinical practice, including the position of the Federal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Health under President Bill Clinton. Dr. Malone is internationally recognized as the first African-American General Secretary of the United Kingdom Royal College of Nursing, representing over 400,000 nurses and served as a member of the UK delegation to the World Health Assembly. And last but not least, Dr. Ernest Grant is currently the Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Duke University School of Nursing. And he's also an adjunct professor at UNC Chapel Hill. He is also the immediate past president of the ANA, the nation's largest nursing organization representing 4.3 million registered nurses. He is the first man to be elected to the office in its 127 years of existence. A distinguished leader, Dr. Grant has more than 30 years of nursing experience and is an internationally recognized burn care and fire safety expert. For the past four years in a row, Dr. Grant has been recognized by Modern Healthcare Magazine as one of the 50 influential clinical executives in healthcare and as one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare. In 2002, President George W. Bush presented Grant, Dr. Grant with a Nurse of the Year Award for his work in treating burn victims from the World Trade Center site. He has been nationally recognized for his work addressing racism, equity, and inclusion within the nursing profession. So as we start today's webinar, please, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to put in the question and answer, and we will address them later on. I am now gonna pass it over to our moderators for today's webinar, Dr. Kenya Beard, Dr. Ashley graham Perel, and Dr. Renitha Julian. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Bryant, for welcoming us into this space. I am trying not to fangirl, so for all of the participants, 
I feel you know that I am so excited to be here. And I'll start off our questions um, with just picking your brain on our position as Black leaders. It is clear that Black leaders face unique challenges in leadership in comparison to our non-Black leaders. And we often hear phrases like, you got to do what you got to do. And you know how it is. You have to work 10 times harder. And I feel like I just felt a unison mm -hmm, from the crowd, right? So considering this, can you share your perspective of the art of being a Black leader and what you think are those unique skills that one must possess to be successful in this artistry? I'll start first with uh, Dr. Ernest Grant. No, well, thank you, uh, first of all, for the opportunity to be here this uh, afternoon. It's indeed an honor to um, be on stage with two women that I love and admire and uh, want to give praises and shout out to because they blazed the trail for me. So my hat's off to uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Malone and uh, Dr. Nichols. Um, I guess I'll come at this question from a, a different way. You know, being uh, a black male and a female dominated profession um, where it's difficult I guess you could say for some people who want to take orders from a man to begin with, but also just a black male. And I grew up at the end of segregation when I entered the the, the nursing profession. So even uh, I come at this question from the different leadership roles, from even being a charge nurse uh, at the bedside to um, joining my professional association, assuming leadership roles, chair of committees, chair of districts, chair of the state, uh, association and eventually moving up to my position within a a as well. Um, and your audience can't see, but I'm six foot six. So I realize that I'm a very imposing individual to begin with as well. Uh, but somewhere in, in the back of your mind, you always are anticipating, uh, you know, how to set yourself apart to be able to get people to uh, go along uh, with what you would like to do. Um, I find that my leadership skills, I try to be someone who is transformational, but also recognize the art of compromise and that uh, seeking uh, others' opinions, uh, coming at them from an angle, I guess, where they don't expect that you would be coming from is uh, something that is um, uh, one of the things that I've found to be very successful uh, in my leadership journey and getting others to go along with uh, uh, things that I may, uh, you know, may have. Uh, I'm very adept at getting people to think that my idea is actually their idea <laughs> so that we can uh, move forward uh, with that. And that's just one of the techniques that that I've learned. But uh, uh, I do recognize that sometimes um, um, I can perhaps come across as being overwhelming. And so I have to tone that down a little bit in order until people get to know me and then we we get along very, very well. And I, I appreciate you sharing that unique skill of making people think that it's their idea, right? That you came up with this. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna build on what you shared regarding the art of compromising for some of our peers in the, in the room. I think that a challenge will be compromising when you're losing something out of it. And I feel often as a leader and one that identifies as black, sometimes you compromise to our detriment. Can you speak more about that? That's a really great, uh, great uh, question. I, I think um, one of the, the leadership positions that I held, I was chairman of the board of the National Fire Protection Association, which is a uh, fire and life safety standards making organization. And it's all about compromise because you get people who are in the industry, you get people who are the end users, and sometimes it did not see eye to eye. So if you want to make progress, Yes, there are things that you uh, you have to give up. And then there are some things, though, as long as you say this is a, um, you know, uh, a, a no go uh, or, you know, this has to stay. Um, a lot of times, even though some people may be in opposition to that, what I've found as a leader is as long as they feel that their voice has been heard. And one of the things I'm very good at is listening and listening intensely, uh, intensely to individuals. Um, that tends to soften 
any angst or any anxiety that they may have about you know losing or on, on my end of things as well if i'm you know giving up something i would point it out you know i'm giving up this very important thing but let's see where we can meet in the middle and usually nine times out of ten we wind up having very good success the fact that we uh you know we each gave a little but for the sake of moving forward um, you know, we can always revisit the, the issue, but uh, the urgency of the moment uh, you know, determines that we, we need to move the issue forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. And Dr. Nichols, talking about the art of compromising with your background in collective bargaining, I know that must be something you're very familiar with. So I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective on this art of being a Black leader and those skills that we need to be successful. Yes, I would like to put mine uh, in the context of uh, when I became the ANA president and how I decided to run. Um, I, I was elected to the ANA board of directors, and uh, from uh, having been president of the Wisconsin Nurses Association, and uh, I just observed, and I observed the following things: uh, one, uh, the ANA is 5,000% committed to making whoever is in the president's role be effective and have what they perceive uh, what's needed in order to represent the profession in a professional way. Uh, and generically, they are committed to that. That's above and beyond the individuals that have differences of opinion, but the collective aggregate view is ANA cannot afford to have a president that is uh, mediocre. And so the whole, whole organization uh, puts its resources to try to make sure the president looks good, does the right thing, is in the places where they need to be in order to serve the, the larger good, uh, which is the profession. But keeping in mind that I was the first and the problem with being the first, there are no rules you're creating the rules and you don't know whether what you're doing is right, wrong, or in between. And, and uh, initially I relied upon the ANA staff for direction because I did not know the landscape or the terrain. And that was fine as long as I did as I was told. <laughs> Once I had an idea of my own and decided that I was going to be a leader, I had all kinds of internal battles, too many to even confront. I, it was just unbelievable. So uh, the unspoken reality is, which is also factual, staff on a particular topic knows more than you do. They're the specialist and you're the generalist and you're learning. And yet you have to speak like a specialist on any given day on some particular topic. Two, so what that means is internally, the staff are always trying to get your ear to present their view. And the staff at times have different views. So you're worried about how do I survive this? And you know, wh whose view do I need to know? So I would give you um Socrates words, which is know thyself, which means believe in you and have confidence in your own ability. Because as my mom's saying, which served me well here is the best weight you will ever lose is the weight of other people's opinions. Because everybody's got an opinion of what you should do as the ANA president, the staff the presidents of the states, the constituencies, the professional organizations that you work with, everybody knows what it is you should be doing. And of course, what I found absolutely interesting is the whole time you're running for president or seeking the presidency, people want to know what you think, what you think, how are you going to represent, what are you going to do, blah, 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 blah. Once you get in the presidency, you cannot have an opinion of your own. 
<laughs> you cannot, because you are there to represent the organization. And the organization gets represented through the resolutions that get passed that may not be your opinion. So it, it's just, it's kind of saying, oh my goodness, I, I didn't realize this is how it works. So it's the difference of knowing internally how it functions versus the perception from out from outside. Uh, that your leadership, if you will, is controlled, maybe that's the wrong word, maintained, sustained by your understanding of executing the will of the members. And the will of the members is expressed in the resolutions that are passed at convention. And your goal in relationship to the membership is to make sure that the staff is congruent with that. Because <laughs> when I was there, the majority of the staff at that time were nurses. I, I think it's much more generalized now. I think they don't have as many nurses. But it was all nurses when I was there. And the three issues that were exceptionally controversial were they had passed a resolution, baccalaureate education by 1985. I mean, you thought the world was going to stop and come to an end. That followed the 1965 A&A position paper that Rosa, Rosella Schlotfeld read that said, nursing as a profession ought to have baccalaureate as entry as other professional groups. We need to get rid of this, this is diploma education. And mm -hmm. I attended the New Jersey uh, State Nurses Association in 1980, where the New Jersey Hospital Association bust in 30 bus loads of diploma nurses who and, be, and came and voted down the New Jersey resolution to make baccalaureate education available in 1985. And they were able to do that because New Jersey's laws were all people, all registered nurses who attended the convention served as delegates and could vote if they were paid members. So, Dr. Nichols, as you hold that thought, I, I do want yeah. to be able to hear from Dr. Malone. And if That's you know fine. anything about Dr. Nichols, she will give us the tea and things that we have not heard before. So I am soaking all of this in. So building on what Dr. Nichols mentioned about navigating that landscape of uncertainty, knowing thyself, and I love your mama's suggestion of the only weight that will do you good is losing that of opinions of others. Dr. Malone, can you add to that about the skills that we need to possess as Black leaders to be successful in this industry? Well, it's an honor to follow Ernie and to follow, of course, the first African-American president of the a and the illustrious Barbara Nichols, who can give you a history lesson for our day colleagues because she knows it backwards and forwards. And, uh, you know, just amazing. Um, so one of the things you need to do is understand who came before you and make sure you have someone coming after you. That's our job. You appreciate who, who precedes you and you make sure that there's someone behind you. That's what every black leader should be about. It's not just about us. So I would say to begin with is that I was born in Kentucky. I went to all black schools until the sixth grade. The reason that I know that I'm smart is I had the teacher who taught my grandmother, taught my mother, and told me I was smart like them. I had no idea what that meant, but whatever it was, I knew it was good. And so I grew up kind of with this assurance that I was smart. And in a school that got integrated when I was in the sixth grade, and then it was all white, right? Um, I needed to be confident enough to know that I had a place. And I think that lesson served me very well because I've always had to know I have a place. There's a song that, um, it's a gospel song. It says, I'm, I'm walking in my authority, living life without apology. It's not wrong, dear. I belong here. So you might as well get used to me. To me, that is the issue that every black leader needs to understand. We belong here. There's nothing wrong about my leadership. 
I'm supposed to be here. It's your problem. You need to get used to me. So I started with that as an understanding, as a platform. Now, my goal, my North Star, was to get a washer and dryer when I graduated from college. Because I was tired of hanging clothes on the line, those very wet clothes, wet clothes, those sheets and bedspreads, they were bigger than I was. And I decided that my goal in life was just give me a washer and a dryer and I'll be happy. I don't need to lead anything. Yes, I'm smart. I don't have to share that with anybody. I'm fine. I'll be a great nurse and I can do that. So that was my perspective when I started my career. And it took time to get over that. I went to my graduate program with Dr. Peplau, Hildegard Peplau, and she said, if you don't want to be a leader, you shouldn't be here. You should leave now. So I had to get a grip on myself. What happened to my washer and my dryer? And um, she wanted me to be a leader. leader. I wasn't interested. I noticed that leaders, that when they proclaimed that they were, that a target appeared on their forehead and people took out not BB guns, but cannons to them. So you have to be prepared for that, that when you step up and put your head above the crowd, you will get shot at. It's okay. It's a natural thing. You don't have to stand there and take it, but boy, should you expect it. If you're really any kind of leader worth your salt, you're, you're a threat to people. And Ernie has a way of managing that. I mean, burn care. I, some of the most extraordinary nurses in the world are burn nurses. But for some of us, I'm a psych nurse, so I want to talk to you about it and get your feelings about it and see what your problem is and how long you've been having this problem that you can't accept me for who I am. And I will do my best to accept you. The other thing that I would mention and call me, Ashley, if I start running over, because like all of my colleagues, I have a story to tell, um, is the definition of excellence. I think every leader needs to claim it co-creating and implementing transformative strategies with daring ingenuity. If you're not ready to step up to the plate and co-create, that means partner with other people. That means understanding, sorry, I know you're here, but you're not all that in a bag of chips. You need others to work with. You need to know how to step up and you need to know how to step back. Otherwise, there's not a lot of use for you. Every now and then you might be relevant, but not for a long time. So co-creating, but it's not enough to co-create. You then have to implement it. If you never implement a great idea, a vision, you're hallucinating. A vision without action is just simply a hallucination. So get over yourself. Stop hallucinating and start implementing, tracking, evaluating, and going on to the next level. So you co-create, you implement, and you want transformational strategies. You just don't want to rearrange the deck chairs on any ship, including the Titanic. You want to make sure that you're making a difference that generates something beyond you. And then you do it with daring ingenuity. Come on, creativity, knowledge, but you are brave and courageous and you jump off cliffs, understanding that sometimes you have a parachute and sometimes you may not. Understanding that when you fall, you have enough colleagues who can help get you up. And you turn to your colleagues for them. And some of them may be white, some of them may be black, some, I mean, a, you name it. You don't parcel out just black folks as your only colleagues. You understand that it takes more than that and that we have a message for the world. I'm walking in my authority, living life without apology. I belong here. So you just might as well get used to me. That's who we are. Yolanda, I mean, Ashley. Ooh, you could change my name to Yolanda. You could call me whatever you want. Do you <laughs> feel empowered? I, I'm looking to my peers in the, in the participants group. Do you feel empowered? I am inspired already. Um, I'm going to hand it off to the brilliant Renita Julian. Dr. Julian, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you so much to our esteemed past presidents. I'm Renita Julian from Rush University in Chicago, and I have the honor of the second question. When you reflect back on your presidency and consider the historical events that were unfolding, what would you say was the most 
pivotal moment and how did that moment influence your path forward? Um, and this time, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Malone with her voice still ringing in my heart from her previous response. Sure, I'll be happy to start. Um, you know, I had to look this up because I said, what did I do uh, between 1996 and 2000? What were the issues? I went on the line to see. And it's very simple for me. I was the one of the three nurses nominated by President Bill Clinton to sit on the Patient Bill of Rights, the commission to develop the Patient Bill of Rights, which eventually moved into the National Quality Indicators for the Nation and the National Quality Forum that is still in existence today. And I was the only nurse on that group that put that together. So that was very, I mean, wow, that was meaningful to me. When I was on that commission, I met some of the most influential and powerful people who would then steer my career in a number of different ways. Um, I, I've been the chair, not chair, I've been on the Kaiser Family Foundation called KFF board because I met at that time players who are on the board who could then recommend me to the board. That was during that commission. That was while I was president of ANA. Most of my time now as a senior, I, I'm rather senior because you know I'm old now, older. And um, most of my time is spent making connections for other people and making connections for the organization, the National League for Nursing. The only way that I can do that is because of all of the connecting pieces that have been my life at a systems level, at an individual level, at a group level, it's making those connections. So having worked with the President Bill Clinton, having worked with his wife, Hillary Clinton, Senator Hillary and you know, Ambas uh, Secretary of State Hillary, all of those I found in other parts of my life. When I was over in England, when I was working with Ireland, they would come over there. When the UK woke up and realized that they had hired the first black African-American executive for the, the esteemed Royal College of Nursing, they said, oh my goodness, this was a mistake. And so Tony Blair talked to Bill Clinton and said, I've got one of yours over here. And Bill Clinton being the incredible glib tongue that he has said, probably didn't even remember me, but he said, oh yeah, she's one of mine. She's very, very good. And so then Prime Minister Blair came back and said, oh, I talked to somebody who knows you. I, I was elevated, not by the Royal College of Nursing, but by the government of the UK. So I can tell you colleagues that what we've got to do in our presidency, whenever you hit that moment that you have that opportunity to make a difference, do make your connections, keep a list of who you're talking to. There is no one who has a better list than Barbara Nichols. She remembers everything, everybody she ever met. Some of us can't do that. We actually have to make lists. So use your phone to make your list of people that you know, people that can make a difference, not just now, but in your life. And that's what I did with that quality forum. Uh, I remember too that my mother got to meet Bill Clinton and shake his hand because they had a big celebration about who was on the committee. It meant so much for my mom to shake hands with the president of the United States. That was because I was ANA president. And that role was like a platform for me. And I just had to give back. And we're gonna give back anyway. I think most black leaders are convinced we need to give back. But the question is also, what are you gonna take with you? Not just what you give back, what are you going to take from that? Is it gonna be your last hurrah? Or are you going to make a difference out there with what you gained while you were there? Are you going to mentor, coach, and make sure there are others? And I know that's what both of my, my colleagues, my those who I admire, Barbara and Ernie, I know they're doing it already. That is your substance. I recommend it highly. Thank you so much, Dr. Malone. And as we continue our conversation on this topic, and I'm taking away leaders are connectors and leaders are learning about connections and holding on to those spaces, I'd like to um, get your thoughts on that question, Dr. Nichols. Well, I would say it was 
one word over and over and over again, and that is relationships, 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 relationships. The value of creating relationships has this practical outcome. Let's use Beverly's example. Because she served under the Clinton's administration, she gained informal credibility with the prime minister of the UK in a job that I was there. They treated her terrible uh, in the sense that it just reeked with bias and prejudice. First, that she was an American. They didn't care about it being, I mean, being black just made it worse. <laughs> like the worst of it all was that she was an American. And then to add insult to injury, a black American. And I attend, I made it my business to, through CGFNS to go to the Royal College of Nursing meetings. And I have never seen anything so racist and so biased. Those members would stand up and call her every name that you could think of in a very polite English way. And I would say to Beverly, how do you stand this? She said, shut up, Nichols. I got to get through this. I would say, better you than me, because I'd have to tell them off. She was superb in the sense that you have to respond to the situation that you're in. And guess what, folks? We don't get a we don't get a pass. Sure. If she had sure. responded back with the same prejudicial bias statements that they put on her, she would not be able to say with truth and grace that she was an effective, competent leader in that role. Because all they would be talking about was how she acted inappropriately and who she insulted. So the lesson there is, in spite of what comes on your plate, mm -hmm. as she would say, you have to know yourself and work and walk in your own confidence and your own authority. And that's hard. My situation was not as, um, I guess, universal as Bev's in that I grew up in Maine in a majority white community. During my whole presidency, the Blacks called me, you know, I was like Amos and Andy. Mm -hmm. They felt I was the white person's Black. I, what, what, what was I doing for the Black folks? Well, I didn't know any Black folks because guess what? Maine is the most white state in the nation, and I went to a majority school. And when I joined the Navy... The Navy was the last service to accept Blacks in the nurse corps. So I didn't have a cadre of Black folks behind me. This is the lesson learned. Black folks, as a generalization, didn't have enough sense to say, come on, we'll help you. We can get behind you. I mean, I have thought about this. I got invited to every prestigious school of nursing while I was ANA president. Yale, Stanford, Columbia, UPenn, uh, U yeah, Indiana University, you name them. Uh, get, uh, as a visiting scholar, uh, giving uh, a week's uh, leadership, I, get, I didn't get invited to not even one Black school of nursing. And why was that? Because internally amongst the Blacks, I was not the Black of choice. What does that mean? What it meant was, and this is factually true, the person who had carried the weight, rang, uh, uh, sounded the horn, was Ethelene Shaw, Shaw from Ohio. She kept a as feet to the fire about the need, it was then called affirmative action. And she was responsible for ANA creating the Commission on Human Rights early on and dealing with its prejudices and biases. And it was felt that really, Ethelene, if there was going to be a first Black president, it should have been 
Ethelreen. I served on the board with Ethelreen and she was third vice president. I don't know why we had all these vice presidents. We had a first vice president, <laughs> second vice president, and a third vice president. I don't know what all these vice presidents did, but we had them. She was the third vice president. And I remember saying to her, Ethelreen, why don't you run for president? And she said, no, I'm going to get go out and get my doctorate. And when I said I was going to run, they all laughed because they thought, who's, who's ever heard of you? And all I could say is, my mother has. <laughs> <laughs> that was about it. And then the final thing I will say is, the connection that Bev and I have is Hilda God Peplau. Because Hilda was the executive director uh, during a period when I was on the board, having left the ANA presidency. And she gave me a lot of advice. And basically what she said is this, most people think you get to, to be, get in this role because you're so hoity-toity. But in fact, in some instances, it's just being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So do not squander that and use this time for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And so she was really very helpful in helping me to rethink uh, the role. And she said, you can't, you cannot get uptight about what the black folks aren't doing. They don't, they don't know. So one of the things you have to keep in mind, which is why I'm glad you're having this kind of workshop is you have to bring them along. She said, when I talked to her about, you know, I don't understand why the black schools aren't inviting me. She said, because they don't understand the politics of it. She said, share with me what happens when Yale or Stanford invites you. Oh, I said, oh, honey, I'm a scholar for the day. They have a big banquet. I get to meet with the president of the university. Blah, blah, blah. We get, we, the School of Nursing gets nursing week for the day. The deans make a big to do of it. And so they use it as a po political opportunity to enhance and embrace what the school is doing. Blacks at that time didn't get it. Thank you. So are, are important. And um, I guess the final thing I would say is uh, one of the things that happened under my tutelage was we create um, the, a way to accept nurse practitioners at the national level was to create a national joint practice commission, which consisted of medicine and nursing to articulate this emerging role. And in the 70s, during my time, and the early 80s, people got their doctorates working on whether the advanced practice role was an expanded role or extended. So we had all this dialogue about the difference between expanded and extended. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Nichols. Could, could, yes. could you, I asked you to hold that thought and okay. <laughs> and thank you for, for that perspective, which huge historical pieces in there and really capitalizing on the importance of connections, relationships, taking advantage of, of places and spaces where you find yourself. And I'd like to move on um, and with the same question for Dr. Grant. Well, um, my situation, I think, was just a little bit different in that uh, I, I think my most uh, pivotal moment, uh, it occurred on not when I was elected president. I remember that date as well, June 18th of 2018, three o'clock in the afternoon when they announced the results. So history was made, broke the glass ceiling. Uh, but mine occurred uh, about a year uh, and a few months later, and that was on March 13th, 2020 because that's when the country shut down because of COVID. So I happened to be president at, uh, you know, only one other time when you had a pandemic, uh, you know, to uh, affect the, the globe. And what do we do about that? How do we respond? And just going back to Dr. Nichols' words of you respond to the situation that you're in, uh, knowing that the country, actually the globe shut down, and I remember meeting with the ANA staff. Um, we were scheduled to have a staff meeting actually that uh, that uh, uh, that Friday, and uh, we held the staff meeting, but it was remote. I was the only one, myself and a couple of other people were the only one at headquarters.
because travel had been uh, cut. Uh, but I remember meeting with the staff and saying, you know, we've got to prepare nurses because no one knew how this virus is being spread. Nurses need to be educated. Um, meeting with members of the White House uh, for the COVID task force, members of Congress, to tell them that the distribution chain was not working the way they had envisioned, uh, that there were counterfeit masks that were coming in, uh, you know, and hospitals outbidding one another so that, you know, they could get these masks regardless of whether or not they were, they met NIOSH standards or not. There was education that uh, nurses needed. You needed to educate the public as well, especially once we were able to get a vaccine, um, you know, and not just the public in general, but also, uh, the uh, ethnic minorities because of the distrust that they have of the uh, the healthcare system. So going on TV, radio, um, and I, again, want to give a shout out to uh, to Dr. Nichols and, and Dr. Malone, because they too, you know, ANA was a little bit hesitant at one point to, uh, you know, to have me uh, go forward at the be beginning of, of that. And Barbara Nichols, as you can pretty well tell, she's not a, uh, she's not a reserved person. So she picked up the phone and <laughs> <laughs> and made a few phone calls, but uh, you know, from from there, we you know we were able to to champion and the calls. He, he's being polite, but let me be direct. <laughs> they were having staff people mm -hmm. speak mm -hmm. on behalf of the profession. Mm -hmm. Not that the staff weren't articulate; they articulate mm -hmm. they were. But hey, mm -hmm. that's the role of the, president. Of the president, and right. you don't bypass the president. Mm -hmm. so I got on the mm -hmm. phone and said, "Why isn't our president speaking mm -hmm. for us?" The AMA president was speaking for them. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so after that's that, all it took. <laughs> was, so, <laughs> so you see why why I love these two women. And uh and again, uh, you know, give them, you know, uh thanks and glory for blazing the trail for me because they really did make my way much easier. Uh but also just I, I think the other pivotal moment was as a result of COVID, we know that you know, racism, you know, reared its ugly head even more so. So I think the creation of the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing and getting all nursing organizations involved and that work is still moving forward to this very day. Um, I think those are the uh, you know the the pivotal moments as we uh, as I reflect back on my presidency and and would be very uh, very proud that um, you know there is an indelible mark that is is left there. So uh, I, I know we're probably running short of time, so I'll just cut it short at, at that. But I, I, I think you, you get the picture of what, uh, you know, what um, my pivotal moment uh, involved. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will hand off to our own Dr. Kenya Beard. Thank you, Dr. Julian. And thank you for this rich, rich discourse. Oh my goodness. When you guys led, it sounds like the three C's that come to my mind, courage, Clinton, and COVID. Mm -hmm. And those were some pivotal moments that that helped to move nursing forward. But I want to get really into the specifics. I, I keep hearing Dr. Malone's voice co-creating and implementing strategies with daring ingenuity. And that's how you really want to bring about transformation. So when you think about and reflect on your presidency, you definitely played a central role in advancing critical policies and practices. In what ways have your policies advanced the nursing profession? And let's start with Dr. Nichols. I'm gonna hold you to four minutes, Dr. Nichols, because I wanna get okay. everyone's that's comment. That's fine, that's fine. I don't have a watch, so that's good. Um, <laughs> um, my, my goal was to implement the 1980, the 1978 resolution that said baccalaureate education for entry by 1985. It was horrendous. I was at the American Medical Association House of Delegates where they passed a resolution which basically said baccalaureate nursing is deleterious to the public's health. And thank goodness someone had the good sense before they left the meeting to rescind that stupid resolution. But you have to remember historically, uh, both the American Hospital Association and the American Medical Association had committees on nursing and they defined what, who we were and what we did and what was important. And it was difficult for us to have our own voice. So one of the things that was critical to my role 
was advancing nursing speaking on its own behalf. That was almost unheard of. You don't, you don't think about that now. But during my time, nursing's credibility wasn't tied to what we said. It was tied to what the doctor said or what the American Hospital Association said. And so I always like to put it in this little rhyme. I help move the profession from around this little rhyme. A dealer, a dollar, a nurse is no scholar. Because we start at, at during my time, deans of schools of nursing had as their highest credential master's degrees. We, we didn't have a lot of doctoral programs. And there was absolute animosity towards baccalaureate education for nursing. They didn't want it. They were all, all supposed to be ignorant and incompetent. And so fighting to say you cannot do what you do not know and education is knowledge that we need for our practice. I don't get it. I hear you. So <laughs> those, of you now, those of you now who think, you know, what, what's your problem? Well, it was a real problem in the late 70s about baccalaureate education because you have to remember since 1898 to 1978, the majority of nurses were diploma grads. Well, how did you feel when you saw? How did you feel when you saw that your voice and your determination to elevate the voice of nursing made its way into the first Future of Nursing report? Well, I thought that was. Uh, I would see that as you have to have a long view. I'm kind of capitalizing on what Bev said. Every some of the some of the things that occur in your presidency is you're establishing the roots. And you won't see the outcome until later. And just let me say there, I wrote these uh, four things down that happened under my presidency that now are now are fully bloomed, but they were major battles. One, the uh, baccalaureate education for entry into practice by 1985, controversial. Um, moving and creating the credentialing center and creating certification exams. a and spent $2 million for ETS to do the credentialing exams along with a national study on the need of credentialing for nursing. With the, that was fought tooth and nail, tooth and nail. And at but the look same at the, time- Look at us now. That's right. Now nobody even thinks about it. You, you gotta be certified. So I, I like what you said. We have to have a long view as leaders and definitely establish roots. So that being said, Dr. Malone, how have your policies advanced the nursing profession? Well, you know, it's really interesting because as a board member, when I was on the board of ANA, and I have to tell you, I figured if I could be on the board at ANA, I should be president. If you can be a board member, colleagues, what stops you from knowing that you can't be president? I mean, huh? If I can do that, surely I can be president. So I want to encourage everybody out there, the board you sit on, don't just think about being on the board, think about being president of that board. Um, and so I was on the board and I was, they asked me to speak about baccalaureate nursing education to the membership of the assembly that was there. And I spoke passionately about why nurses needed to be prepared at the baccalaureate level. I had no idea that would be used to keep licensed practical nurses and associate degree nurses out of, well, not associate degree nurses, but non -R, who, folks who were not RNs, out of ANA. So I, oh, my theme was ANA needed to be a house big enough for all of nursing. Supporting that doesn't mean I don't support baccalaureate preparation. But it should not be the only way. I believe that there has to be room enough for all of us under the umbrella of the American Nurses Association. I, I still believe that, that it's got to be a house big enough for all of us. And that, in, that takes over what Ernie's talking about in terms of marginalized populations, people of color, because there's such a large population that is excluded still. Um, so... It all fits together for me. It's not either or, it's and. 
why can't we say that we do want our nurses to those who want to get to the baccalaureate level please do that and why not skip over baccalaureate go directly to your masters i have no problems with the best prepared nurses possible but it doesn't mean we have to exclude other people it's not a given that that means we keep the door shut and that's my that's my issue to this day there needs to be an escalator of career progression for nursing. And it matters less where you start and more where you end and what you can do all in between your journey. Because I mean, you know, the beginning and the end is life, birth and death. I hope you do something along the way. And that's what I would say to nurses. So for me, that's how I think about it. That the that I hope that what I did at ANA was one that was an umbrella big enough that included issues of social determinants of health, that included issues of racism and implicit bias, but that also included differences of diversity in preparation and providing opportunities for succession, for continued progress for nurses, for finding your voice and then getting excited about it and being able to talk to others and heal the healing piece of nursing. I hope I, and I'm a clinician, I'm an educator, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a little bit of a lot of things. And I think there's even more we can do. We don't have to just do it one way, colleagues. There's plenty good room. Haven't you heard the gospel song saying plenty good room? Plenty good room. We need to make sure there's plenty good room for others. I love that. You know, we have the establishment of roots to making sure we have an escalator for career progression, to, to be inclusive. And I know Dr. Malone, that has been your platform for years. How is nursing making sure that we're more inclusive? Mm -hmm. Are you pleased with where we are at today and where the profession is heading in regard to inclusivity? Oh, uh, there's something that says, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm getting better all the time. And I think that's what we're doing. It's we're not where we were when I came in the door, when Barbara came in, the, even when Ernie came in the door, mm -hmm. but we're not where we need to be. But it means that we're continuing to develop and we have to keep pushing that envelope. We don't stop pushing it. And Ernie's anti-racism uh, initiative that is so inspirational uh, and so needed, that's a push. And I am so supportive of that brilliance of the work. And I hope he gets recognized all over the globe for that work. Um, so yes, we're not where we were, but we sure aren't where we need to be. But we're headed in the right direction. And I expect all of us, everybody on this call, to put your shoulder to the wheel and move it forward. Together, if we push together, we can move that forward. And that means having room and heart enough to be inclusive of your colleagues. What Barbara experienced when she came in as president, you're not black enough? Oh, you maybe too black uh, for some people and not black enough for other people. That's ridiculous. We need to be better to one another. We need to stop that negative behavior. There's enough negativity for everybody. Come on, That's grow right. up, everybody. Put on your big boy pants and your big girl pants and grow up. It's time for us to do better. And we can do better because we get we're getting better every time. Mm -hmm. If I quoted you right, so yeah. thank you, Dr. Malone. So, Dr. Grant, we mm -hmm. went from the BSN as a wish, strengthening <laughs> inclusivity. These ladies have given you the They've baton to move forward, and, and tell us how have your policies advanced the profession. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, I, I feel like I've, I've been at church. The only thing we need to do now is just pass the collection plate here. But uh, uh, I, I think, um, you know, from the very first time that I remember meeting Dr. Malone, and and she is from my uh, home state of North Carolina, and uh, I remember seeing her at the North Carolina Nurses Association and et cetera. But when she was president of ANA, I walked up to the podium one, uh, one morning uh, after uh, she'd given her keynote address. And I'm sure she remembered me saying, I want to be up here one day. And she said, you can. And she's right by, you know, with her comments of uh, telling folks in the audience, if you are a member of a board, just don't stop there. You know, um, you know, I did not stop. But I also knew that if I was going to be president, I 
needed to, I didn't realize that I'd be the first male, uh, first African-American male uh, president of ANA, but I knew that there were some things I did not want to give people uh, to have to look back on. You know, I didn't have leadership experience. All he has is a master's and everything else. So that drove me to go back and get that doctorate, to get leadership in other uh, organizations as well, so that there was no no question about that. But I, I will say, though, uh, under my tutelage, as we talked about with the addressing the the racism factor it's always people who have heard me talk will always hear me say that i'm a firm believer that nursing should be reflective of the people that we care for that means getting more uh ethnic and minority nurses you know at the bedside or in leadership p p positions uh so that we can have better patient outcomes and be more representative of society and also more men within the profession as well. I, I think one of the things that is holding nursing back is the way we as a society treat women. And with nursing being a female dominated profession and we you know, don't want to give women the respect that they need and deserve, uh, you know, that has been something that has held the profession back, I believe. So we definitely need to get this uh, change of, of mind, if you will, and, um, and let nursing lead nursing and not let other organizations tell us who we are and what we should be doing as a profession. We have that. Uh, I think also ANA's, uh, you know, coming up with, uh, as we did the uh, the work of the commission, coming up with a definition of racism, ANA's reconciliation statement. That's a, uh, you know, that's a huge thing moving forward. And as uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Nichols and uh, Dr. Malone has talked about, these are planting the little seed. It would be interesting to look back 10 years from now on my presidency and see where the initiatives that we have started just over the last you know, couple of years, where they are within the profession. And I would hope that they have grown to uh, take deep roots and that we don't have to be talking about um, you know, getting more ethnic and minority nurses within the profession because they will be there. Uh, more men, they will be there. Uh, there would be the uh, the argument of is nursing a profession or is it a, an art or or whatever? It will be there. That's what I'm looking forward to to seeing within the next decade. Great, great comment. I'm wondering if you could speak to because I heard when you said you know it needs to be nursing leading nursing, mm -hmm. but now you see all of these new legislative mandates coming down the pike saying you can't say this and you can't say that in certain states, um, how would you respond to that for our audience who's listening that they might come from those states? Well, my response is that we need to, as, if I may borrow uh, uh, Dr. Malone's uh, uh, phrase there, we need to put our big pants on <laughs> and become advocates going down to your state capital, talking with your senators, your, your, uh, your representative at the state level and at the national level, and saying, you know, they know what they're doing is not right. You know, people who are, are advocating for this, they are afraid. They are, and, and when you're you're frightened, you begin to uh, cut off, uh, you know, things that, uh, you know, you see as a threat. Uh, and I think as nurses, if we set and remain complacent, that means that we are allowing this to happen. And then when it happens, we're gonna look around and go, what happened? How did this happen? And it happened because you were not an advocate. You were not involved in having a say of, you know, where you want the profession to go, where you want your country to go as well. I, I don't care what, what side of the political spectrum you may be on. The thing is, is you've got to get out there and have your voice heard. Because if you don't, then you don't have the right to sit around and complain about it if, if you just remain complacent. Uh, and don't get me started because, you know, I, I love policy. <laughs> Thank you. Go down that, but uh, I think that's the best answer that I can give you and the quickest answer that I can give you. Well, thank you. I, I love that you, you really emphasize that nurses must lead nursing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's critical. Yeah, so, if, I, if I could just take 30 seconds more. To, sure. Because when I was president of ANA, and I remember walking uh, into the, the halls of Congress the first time and going in and saying, I'm Ernest Grant, I'm the president of the American Nurses Association, and I represent 4.5 million registered nurses. The particular uh, senator that I was meeting with at the, at the time said, and how many of them can vote for me, right? 
quick lesson learned because the next person that I saw, I said, I'm Ernest Grant. I'm president of the American Nurses Association. I represent the nation's 4.5 million registered nurses, of which X amount comes from your state. And if it was a representative, X amount are the ones that you represent in your constituency, you know, to really get down to the point so that they knew that nursing votes, you know, nurses votes. And that's why we, uh, we've got to become active so that they can see the power that we have. You're the largest member of the healthcare profession. You know, it shouldn't be that we're the largest, but yet, yet we're letting other members of the profession walk all over us. There's something wrong with, with that picture. Thank you for sharing that. I think you're spot on. And you just shared again and emphasized that nurses and leaders mm -hmm. must know who they are talking to Absolutely. And, and make sure that they can make the case for why it's so important. Um, we're going to enter the part of this session known as, well, are you familiar with speed dating? Yes. Well, this isn't speed dating. It will be speed discourse. <laughs> so you will have one minute to answer this question. Um, and I'm gonna just start us off and then I'm gonna hand it to Ashley. Frederick, Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Indeed, efforts have been made in the face of adversity to advance the profession. Dr. Graham Perel. We want the next question now, Dr. Beard. All right. The next question. What do you believe is the most critical struggle in nursing's history? The most critical struggle. Is that to anybody? It is to anyone. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead of my two colleagues here because I know what they're going to say. But I think... Um, Nursing, um, we, we've all heard that term that we, we eat our young, and we certainly do. We, um, you know, any opportunity to try to move the profession forward when we belittle someone or we try to keep people in their place and et cetera, um, you know, our, you know, the members of the other profession that want to keep us down, we're helping them do their job, right? They just sit back on the side and say, hey, we'll just sit back and let them let them uh, chew their, their young, uh, make people become disinterested in trying to advance or advance to leadership roles and et cetera. And uh, I think that's one of the most harmful and hurtful thing that we can do is to try to stifle someone who, someone's vision or someone's, uh, you know, who may want to uh, either move into a leadership position or even just want to be an advocate, uh, you know, by saying, well, I went through it, so, you know, you have to go through it too, no. I tell my students when they uh, start uh, encountering that, you know, flip the script on them and say, you know, why? <laughs> why are you treating me this way? Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I haven't done anything to you. I, I actually could learn from you, from all the, um, um, you know, the experience and things that, that you have. But if you're trying to stifle that, that individual, don't stick around while somebody will not let you grow. You, you need to go plant your, your, your roots in, in firmer soil and go from there. Yeah. yeah. And I'll follow up from Ernie and just say that I think nurses are some of the most brilliant people on the planet. And I'm so proud of my profession and the healing that we do. I, I think we save the world on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And I'm so honored to be part of that. But I don't think we acknowledge ourselves. I don't mm -hmm. think we own it. I don't think we, it, it, people will redefine public health as something not nursing. I, I'm totally don't understand that. I don't understand how things get redefined by others and we allow that to happen. We invent something, somebody else comes along, stands next to us, mm -hmm. next thing you know, somebody else invented it, it wasn't a nurse. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want that for us. I want us to own what we do. I want us to own our relationship with patients that no one else has, that 24 hour full care, we're here with you on your journey from cradle to grave. I want us to celebrate being a nurse and what it means and, and raise it to a level of excellence and honor, honor that it deserves if we don't do it ourselves. So when I introduce myself, I say, I'm Beverly Malone. I'm a psychiatric mental health extraordinaire because I, I'm serious. I am extraordinary as a psych nurse. We need to practice that. We need to practice, I charge 
Oh, mm -hmm. oh, yes, I you have to pay me to do something. Mm -hmm. I'm worth it. Don't worry, you will get your money's worth. Nurses are far beyond excellence. So it's that level of confidence, that level of somebody said courage, that level of authenticity, that level, that's what we need. That's what we do. And my view is we need to, as we start uh, these new decades in the 20th cent in the 20, 20th, 20th year, we need to really embrace education for our practice, mm -hmm. that it is central to care. Knowledge is what makes the difference. And we've always had these conflicting views between uh, defining competence in, in terms of the tasks that you do versus the knowledge that you bring. And care is a combination of all of that. And I think, uh, we, as Bev has mentioned, we do it 24 hours a day. We need to own it and we need to claim it and we need to spell it out. Uh, we are there to provide care and we provide it 24 hours a day and we have a knowledge base for doing it. And I always just like to make the simple point, when I was in nursing school in the 50s, nursing care consisted of giving a bed bath and rolling the patient in a wheelchair out to the solarium to get sun to kill whatever bacteri bacterial <laughs> disease they had and a shot of penicillin, that was the treatment. To look at the technology now that nurses are involved with yeah. uh, and the knowledge you have to have and the competency you have to have to deliver that level of care. So I, I, I think we have to embrace uh, what nursing is first, foremost, and forever. It's about care. Mm -hmm. And we need to um, elevate the clinical competence that we bring to that care. That's right. We don't always focus on our knowledge. I mean, they, they seem surprised when a nurse is knowledgeable. It's like, oh, did you know that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to jump into our next one minute rebuttal and actually going to shift things around a little bit because what I heard you say in terms of um, the most critical struggles in nursing's history sounds like something we're still struggling with now. So um, with that being said, I'm going to skip over that one to allow Dr. Beer to um, come in on our third speed discourse question. Okay. Um, so what I've heard is the struggle is real, that we're still struggling to support each other because we eat our young. Why is that? We're struggling with acknowledging our power, four million strong, and we struggle with embracing our wisdom and knowing that we're extraordinaires, like Dr. Malone said. So as leaders, how do we address this struggle? What do we do to catapult the profession into a space where 20 years from now, we're not still talking about these struggles? Okay, let, let me begin because I have a, I have a difficult time with hearing eat our young. I really, I really don't believe we do that. I think we're human. And I think we have been presented as if we're angels. That's called spiritual. But the truth is we have all of the hidden issues that any other person has. We are competitive. We are at times envious. We are uh, wonderfully giving, and we are selfishly, I mean, all of it, we are human. It's not about, and humans do do negative things sometimes to their children and to those who follow behind them, and they compete. If you're a four-year-old, they may compete with you if they're a 20-year-old. Humans behave like that. So I want us to get to the point that it's not that we have this disease of eating our young, it's we're human. And if you can acknowledge that, then you can do something about it. As long as we pretend that we're not, that the good nurse is one who never thinks those kind of thoughts, who never does that kind of thing. I beg your pardon. I haven't met any. Maybe they have died and gone on to their greater reward. 
So we're going to have to be more realistic with one another about our, our strengths and our weaknesses. We're human. Give us all a break on that. And then when you know it, fix as much of it as you can. That's what your time on earth is about, fixing it to the best of your ability. So that leads to a great question because I, I hear what you're saying. Push back. All of us should push back on that disease called eating our young and just embrace the fact that we're all human, right? And sometimes we actually behave as humans. We That's get right. jealous. We get insecure. We have this imposter syndrome. We right. get envious. We respond negative, negatively. And like you said, we feel like we have to compete. So how do we fix it? Oh, oh. I don't want to hug. So I'm just going to say this one piece. Acknowledge it. Begin there. Put it out there. Write it down in your journal. I am human. Oh, my goodness. How about that? So wow. that's where you start. I'll stop. I know my nope. God, I have more to say. I love that. Acknowledge. It's like so simple, but so important. Right. Almost like an AA meeting. First thing you have to say is I have a problem and this is what it is. Great. Dr. Nichols. Lord, I'm 80. What 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 question are we? <laughs> Remind me of the question. I didn't forgot the question. How do we fix it? We're struggling with all these issues, right? We're struggling to support each other. Oh, we're struggling yeah. to no, acknowledge you, you, our power as a profession that's so large. And we're struggling. You fix, you fix it one step at a time, which means you have to focus on what is my what what am I fixing this month, this day, this year, and stay on it until it's done? Yeah. So you gotta be specific and then have a plan to make it work. That's right. And okay. uh, the, the, the other thing I want to say, and part of fixing it is this building of relationships, because one of the outcomes of relationships is it expands your resources. And, you know, I have an example here, which was just very quick. a and a was hosting the, what is the 1980, whatever, when I was president, White House, um, White House Conference on Aging. And the AMA had the best data on aging because we had a good relationship at that time with the AMA executive board. We called them, we said, could we have access to your data? The EVP said, yes, call the dire my director of research and tell them I told you that you could have the real on whatever it was. Now, do you think if we had done the usual thing, wrote a letter, dear Mr. Chat, dear Mr. Person in charge of the AMA data resource, could you please give us this? He would have said, hell no. They would have 5,000 rules. But because there was a relationship with the EVP, we asked him, he told him to give it to us. Right. So Love it. relationships matter. Matter because they also expand your resources and make you better. All right. So that's one way to fix it. White House Conference on Aging. Okay. That's one way to fix it. Recognize that relationship building is important. So right. I hear what you're saying. I hear what Dr. Malone said. But Dr. Grant, do you think that the ANA is working to fix these historical issues, these historical struggles? Um, and if not, what do you think is missing? Yes, they are. Um, you know, I truly believe. But one thing that people have to understand, though, is it's impossible for the ANA to be all one thing to to, to everyone, because everybody's going to have their their own little um, nuances, if you will, that uh, that reign supreme for them. And you know, it's hard to try to you know uh, be the the servicer, if you will, for you know 4.5 million registered nurses who all have 4.5 million different ideas as to how the profession should be run, or how the organization should be ran, or or just you know life in general should should, should be ran. But I think uh, compared to at the time that uh, Dr. Nichols uh, was serving as president, the time that Dr. Malone was serving as president, and the time that uh, I came along, great strides have been made and will continue to be made. Uh, we have to adjust to, um, you know, a, a new group of, of nurses, if you will, that have different priorities than what was a priority when I was coming along. Uh, you know, when I was in school, uh, I frequently say that my uh, instructors 
you know, it was a it was a no brainer that when you graduated, you were going to join A and A in your state nurses association. There's no if, end, or buts about it. And everybody was told to go to the you know the district meeting or whatever else. But one of the things I noticed was that my professors were there, not just to check the role, but they were at the microphone asking those difficult questions. They were chairing committees. They were showing us how it was done. That's not done today in a lot of nursing schools. Now it's just, let's teach to the test. And, you know, and uh, you know, if you want to join a profession, then fine. And if not, you know, get on with your life. We need to be able to, you know, go back to, to that and, um, and be able to, meet the the needs of the millennials, the Gen Xers, Gen Yers, and, you know, whatever else is, is after them. Uh, but, you know, they are the, the future of the profession, and they need to, um, you know, take, take on the reins and realize what's coming down the pike and that they are, in, you know, the profession, uh, they are in charge of the, of the profession. So we've got to uh, be able to have a profession that, uh, you know, that they feel that they can belong to and that is serving their needs. Thank you for sharing that. I, I agree that modeling that advocacy and, and showing students how their voice matters mm -hmm. with advancing policies, it's important. Um, we're gonna shift and allow the audience to ask questions. They've been waiting so patiently, but before I, I switch and hand the mic over to um, Dr. Bryant, I wanna thank each and every one of you, of you for sharing your oral history with Dr. Graham Perel and Dr. Julian and myself two years ago. Um, the publication will come out this year. Your journey into, through, and beyond your presidency at the ANA is definitely going to have a huge impact and already has on current and future nurse leaders. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Bryant. Yes, we do have some questions in the chat. So please feel free, whoever would like to take this question first. It is, there are so many disturbing metrics around health equity. What advice can you give on what we should focus on to really impact health equity? You're all thinking, who would like to take that <laughs> one first? I think we need to understand what structural racism is, that we need to understand our history. We need to appreciate, we can't let people destroy it. Mm -hmm. And I, what I hear happening in some of the states right now is a redefinition of the truth, a redefinition of history. Mm -hmm. We can be redefined out of existence. And I am not willing for someone to distort my truth. And so I'm, I, I, I'm so convinced that there's a time that you have to stand up. Mm -hmm. And Barbara mentioned something earlier. She said, you can't do everything in one gulp, basically. And there's a thing that says it's a cinch by the inch, mm -hmm. but it's hard by the yard. So sometimes you have to inch your way along in life. And this is going to be an incher. I mean, we there will be some giant steps, but there will be also some backward steps. And so we, we find ourselves moving forward, like with, you know, we had a we have a black president, and I'm not talking about Ernie, I'm talking about Obama, and then there's regression. Mm -hmm. And so, and with Ernie, we have a black president, a male president of AA, and then perhaps there's gonna be a little regression. It doesn't have to be all the way back. There's a thing called um you learn, it's a progressive learning. So mm -hmm. you move up and then you fall back. It feels like you fell way back here, but you didn't. You just took one step back. But it feels like you were demolished. The truth is you just took a minor step back. You take another. So you're continually moving up. It's that Z-like behavior that you're growing. We have to have the confidence that we're growing and pass the baton on to others. Hmm. I agree with what uh, Dr. Malone said. I, I think, um, you know, one of the, the big struggles that I see a lot of um, institutions, be it universities, be it uh, healthcare facilities, um, th that I see that they're having is when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are we rebranding that? Uh, you know, I, I think we need to understand that inclusion means all of us. And I, I think individuals who would seek to change that or to destroy that need to understand that their voice is welcomed at the table as well. 
Um, you know, it, you know, when you say if we're going to be inclusive, that means we we do need to include everyone. But I think that's where we have those difficult conversations is when they do come to the table, and you uh, you know we uh, talk through that that difficult part there. And on the other side is where we're going to have unity. That's where we're going to have equity. Uh, but it, it's a matter of getting there, just as Dr. M Malone says. It's going to be very difficult. And you may see that you make a little progress and then you step back and a little bit more, but uh, it is going to take some time. But I I don't know if if rebranding it is, um, it may work for some, it may not work for, for others, but uh, you know, until we can get everyone to come to the table and begin to uh, address these issues, we're not gonna go anywhere. We're, we're just spinning our, our tires. I think we have to understand that uh the dynamic of problems and issues the flip side of that is it is an opportunity for change and to do something differently mm -hmm. so what you have to always remember is there are always two sides of the coin that's right and so the problem as difficult as the struggle may be is in fact an opportunity for you to make a change forces you to see things differently provides, if you will, uh, a, an instrumentality to do something different. Think about it differently if you were going to solve and resolve it. So once you get through wringing your hands and dealing with the immediacy of the catastrophe, then see this, you know, this is an opportunity for, for us to reinvent, to reimagine, to re-engage in whatever this issue is. So uh, that's not being Pollyanna. That's no. being strategic. No. Yeah. That's yeah. being strategic. Being strategic. Right. And yeah. so I think leaders have to understand that. Although you have to deal with the immediacy of the issue and the problem, you can use that to think beyond that as to what opportunity is it providing you to think differently along this line. Because trust me, if you don't get it right this time, it, it's mm -hmm. going to come back. Mm -hmm. You will have another <laughs> opportunity. And when it comes back, then you'll be ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. You might not be ready the first time, but it, if you haven't solved it, it will be back. All right. Another way of what Barbara's saying is a phrase that said, I can be delayed, but not defeated. Mm -hmm. That means as long as I have breath, I mm -hmm. have opportunity. opportunities. Mm -hmm. And as long as a leader can understand that, they will not get so depressed on a backward step that they lose their sense of courage, their sense of balance. They'll understand... Maybe a step back gives you time to breathe for the next go round. I just have to say, I'm so thankful. You have provided so many quotes. I'm sitting here writing them down <laughs> during this <laughs> session. And we even have a comment that somebody wants to cite a quote by uh, Dr. Nichols that you said earlier about Socrates. Uh, but this <laughs> next question would change gears a little bit. You all have discussed the challenges, the struggles, and how you navigated that uh, as the ANA president. We know it hasn't been easy. So this question is, how did you rejuvenate and take care of yourself during your tenure as presidency? Well, for me, I uh, I failed at retirement. Uh, <laughs> when I was elected president, I had spent 36 and a half years um, at UNC hospitals. So I retired from that position, was president for four years, and then two weeks later, got another job. <laughs> so, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I failed at retirement. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Nichols and, and Dr. Malone can provide a little better answer, but uh, um, I uh, didn't take a vacation actually until May of last year. It was the first vacation I'd taken in like probably 10, 12 years or so. We went on a Alaska cruise. Uh, and I, I know that's it's not it, but that's me though. I I get my joy out of, out of working. I truly do. Well, I would say the same say the same thing. I'm a workaholic. Mm -hmm. I'm still working. In fact, my kids are saying, "What kind of retirement is this? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a full time job. You can't come to this or do that because you're working." <laughs> and hey, um, it keeps me mentally alert from having dementia. I think, and um, also it allows me to participate in the profession that I love and embrace and can still contribute. And what is amazing, folks, look, I'm 85 and a half. And people are still asking me, what do you think? 
that's really quite a privilege. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, think about it. How many 85-year-old nurses do you know that get asked about national issues? Mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of the past, but what you think about them now. Most, most people, you know, we're all in the nursing home rocking in the chair. <laughs> so I feel uh, most, really most, most fortunate. And I think work is what keeps me mentally alert. I know my name, <laughs> <laughs> what day it is. <laughs> I can, I can fill out that little Medicare thing they give you, make the clock go which way. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, for me, um, it goes like this. I love my, my family. My goodness, I've got the most fantastic grandchildren and children you can imagine. That has always balanced me. Always. I didn't have the grandchildren for a while, but I had my kids pre pretty early after I finished my master's. Um, so that's one thing that keeps me going. But my, my faith, I, I'm... I feel blessed. I feel like I'm on a mission. I'm very clear that I'm here for a purpose. I think every nurse has the opportunity to wake up in the morning and say, I know why I'm here. I'm here to heal. I'm here to save lives. I'm here to make a difference. And that's whether you have a religious background like me. I grew up in the Baptist church, so I'm totally gone. Yeah, I'm the one that shouts on Sunday and, and during the week too. Um, but not everybody has to be like me to understand the gift of nursing. Mm -hmm. That what a gift it is to be a nurse, to know why you're here, that you're building up life and making a difference. Yeah. There's nothing more precious than that. Yeah. If I could could add to, to what uh, Beverly just said, I have a mantra that I ask myself at the end of the day, every day, and that is, did I make a difference today? No matter what position that I was, was in, if I was at the bedside, I was in an administrative position or even here in uh, on uh, on faculty at, at Duke, I still um, enjoyed the fact that I can lay my head down at night and feel that I did make a difference in some way, shape or form. And um, and I guess that the other way, I guess, to sort of relax me, I love music. Uh, and like Bev, um, you know, love church as well. I, I do backup uh, organ for for my church. So that's uh that's one thing I, I I love when I when I'm told that hey we need for you to you know to play on this particular Sunday or whatever so I'll spend two weeks just you know getting prepared for that so that's a that's a great way to uh, rejuvenate myself as well. One of the one of the observations I've made uh, is that uh, I was uh, the first black president over a quarter of a century ago. I'm still working on it. <laughs> and and the insight I have is the reality is out of the 4.5 4 million nurses, the black presidents are the ones that are remembered. When I ask people, do you know who followed me? They don't, they don't have a clue. Do you know who was the president before me? They don't have a clue, but they know when I was president. And, I, and guess what? I ain't telling them. I know. <laughs> but if you don't know, that's your problem. Oh goodness. It's up to them and, to learn their history. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that I've learned is, which I think would, would go into Bev's position point is as black presidents, we've all been fortunate to move on into other things. When I left the ANA presidency, I was appointed secretary of the Department of Regulation and Licensing for the state of Wisconsin. So I was able to enlarge my understanding of credentialing uh, and certification and licensure. And then from there, I went on to become the CEO of CGFNS. So I had that steady background of dealing with, you know, uh, over uh, 59 occupations and professions in the state of Wisconsin, their licensure issues and their credentials, more than just what's happening with the Board of Nursing. So, and, you know, Bev went on to do other things too, and so will um, Ernest. But I try to look back to see, well, what's happened to other a and presidents? And they, I, I don't know, they kind of, you know. And Dr. They go Nichols, on I, Dr. Dr. Nichols, I don't mean to cut you off, but we are out of time. We okay. appreciate <laughs> all of the stories. Okay. We want to be mindful that we've actually gone a little bit over, but I just want to take this time just to really say, this has been a powerful session. 
there's been so many emotions from being feeling proud, empowered, to just sad about some of the stories that you've shared during your pregnancy. But most important, it's just been inspirational. So we want to express our profound gratitude to all of our distinguished uh, panelists for grant granting us this exceptional opportunity to engage, to hear your stories, your significant contributions to the profession of nursing, your personal challenges and how you navigated around those challenges, and really helped us to understand the transform transformative power of your leadership and advancing equity and justice within healthcare. This session has truly been a testament to the excellence of not only black excellence, but just nursing excellence, showcasing resilience and underscoring the critical role of diversity and molding the future of nursing. So we really would like to thank you for having this conversation. And lastly, Dr. Beard, we have to thank you. This is your, you're the visionary leader behind this, this wonderful webinar. So thank you for organizing this impactful webinar also. So thank all of you for joining us also. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Bryant, Bryant, for leading us. And thank you, Dr. Grant, Dr. Malone, and Dr. Nichols for your wisdom and always being willing to share it. Um, I'll just pass it to Dr. Julian and Dr. Graham Perel if they have anything to add, and then we'll have a, a last closing thought from our past presidents. No, I, I echo the thoughts of everyone who's spoken previously and just like to say for those who are participating, thank you for being here our apologies that we couldn't get to all your questions and you have some mighty powerful questions in that Q&A component. Our apologies, we couldn't get there, but thank you so much for being here. Dr. Graham Perel. Sure, I am fulfilled. I am honored to have the opportunity to hear from you live, hear your lived experiences. And I'm honored to really fulfill my purpose to keep your histories alive and I am sure to do so in my trajectory. So thank you so very much. Closing comment, Dr. Malone. Um, just simply, today is your day. It's an opportunity. Don't take it lightly, use it well, spend it like it's gold, uh, but understand that if you keep your hand closed, you can't get anything. You gotta open your hand in order to receive. Open your hand of knowledge, of mentoring, of caring about one another, as well as caring about yourself. How powerful, Dr. Grant. Sorry, I put myself on mute. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, add to, uh, to to Dr. Malone's comment: uh, not only open your hand, but open your mind as well. Um, you know, so that you can be receptive of others around you. And I would also say, if you haven't gotten yourself a mentor, get yourself a mentor and uh, and be successful. I love it. Open your hand, open your mind. Dr. Nichols? I would say uh, don't forget that leadership is a privilege uh, that few experience, particularly at, at a presidential level of a major organization, and that it is an opportunity personally and professionally to learn and grow. So step mm -hmm. up. To yeah. Step up to the plate. Open your hand, open your mind, and step up to the plate. I love it. Dr. Bryant? No, oh, I said my closing words. I, I'm again. I'm just, just so thankful for this opportunity to hear from all of you. All right. No further closing comments. Thank you all for coming. I'll echo what Dr. Julian said. Thank you so much to the audience for participating. Know that your questions will be answered. Just pick up a copy of their oral history when it comes out later this year. Thanks for joining. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye, everyone.